Happy holidays, my darling little phantoms. Tonight, we have a rare two-part special of Fantastic. In spirit of Christmas mythos, this episode is naughty and revolves around some tales that are themed around the infamous Krampus. Now, of course, with all that out of the way, I'm Lady Lillian McCobb, your hostess for the evening. I want you to grab a nice warm drink, my personal choice is apple cider, Snuggle up with some plushies and some blankets, and enjoy tonight's tantalizing tales. <laughs> to start us off, how about we give ourselves a solid introduction to the myth itself? To so quote Britannica, Krampus was thought to have been part of pagan rituals for the winter solstice. According to legend, he is the son of Hel, the Norse god of the underworld. With the spread of Christianity, Krampus became associated with Christmas, despite efforts by the Catholic Church to ban him. End quote. But to give a more in-depth explanation, I'd like to read a blog post on allthatsinteresting.com. They say he comes on the evening of December 5th, a night called Krampusnacht. You can usually hear him coming as the soft steps of his bare human foot alternate with the quick flop of his cloven hook. And when you see him, you'll instantly notice that he's armed with birch branches, so he can beat naughty children. His name is Krampus, and he's the terror of Austria and the Alpine region around Christmas time. But who is Krampus? Why is he known as the Anti Santa? And how did this disturbing legend come about in the first place? Who is Krampus, St. Nick's evil counterpart? Though descriptions of Krampus' appearance vary from region to region, some things remain consistent. He is said to have pointed devilish horns and a long, snake-like tongue. His body is covered in coarse fur, and he looks like a goat crossed with a demon. His body and arms are strung with chains and belts, and he carries a large sack or basket on his back to cart off the evil children. Krampus comes to town the night before the Feast of St. Nicholas and visits all the houses to dish out his punishments. If you're lucky, you might just get swatted with a birch branch. If you're not, you'll wind up in the sack. After that, you're fit as anyone's guest. Legends suggest you might be eaten as a snack, drowned in a river, or even dropped off in hell. Sometimes, Krampus is accompanied by St. Nicholas, who isn't known to bother himself with naughty children in Central Europe. Instead, he focuses on handing out presents to well-behaved kids and then leaves the rest up to his sinister counterpart. How did Krampus become a regular part of holiday fun in places like Austria, Bavaria, the Czech Republic, and Slovenia? Nobody is entirely certain, but most people believe that Krampus originally hails from the Alpine region's pagan past. His name comes from the German word Krampen, which means claw, and he bears a striking resemblance to the Old Norse legends about the son of Hel, the god of the underworld. It's a compelling theory, especially since Krampus' appearance coincides with the number of pagan winter rites, most notably one that sends people parading through the streets to disperse the ghosts of winter. Over the years, as Christianity gained popularity in the region, aspects of Krampus' appearances began to shift and fall in line with Christians' beliefs. The chains, for example, were not originally a feature of Hell's foolish son. It's believed that Christians added them to evoke the binding of the devil. And that wasn't the only change they made. Under Christian hands, Krampus took on a number of more devilish qualities, like the basket that he uses to carry wicked children to hell. From there, it isn't hard to see how Krampus, already associated with winter festivities, might then have been incorporated into Christian traditions and the legend of St. Nicholas around Christmas time. The Modern Krampus and Krampus Knot Celebration Today, Krampus has his own celebration on the day before the Feast of St. Nicholas in the Alpine region. Every evening on December 5th, a knight called Krampus Knot, elegantly dressed St. Nick's to pair up with monstrously outfitted Krampuses and make the rounds to homes and businesses offering gifts and playful threats. Some people exchange Krampus Knock greeting cards that, that depict the horned beast alongside festive and funny messages. Sometimes, large groups of people dress up as Krampus and run amok through the streets, chasing friends and passerby with birch sticks. This activity is especially popular among young men. 
Tourists who have witnessed this rowdy celebration say that running into a coffee shop won't save you from getting swatted. And the swats aren't exactly gentle, but luckily they're usually confined to the legs and the festive atmosphere often makes up for the occasional welts. The tradition has become an important one in many countries and has come to include expensive handmade masks, elaborate costumes, and even parades, though some complain that the celebration is becoming too commercialized. Many aspects of the old festival endure. Krampus masks, for example, are typically carved from wood, and they are the products of significant labor. The artisans often work for months on the costumes, which sometimes end up on display in museums as examples of living traditions of folk art. The Perseverance of a Frightening Christmas Legend It's always remarkable when ancient traditions make it to the present, but Krampus has had an especially rough fight for survival. In Austria, 1923, Krampus and all Krampusnacht activities were banned by the fascist Christian Social Party. Their motives were a little murky. Though they agreed that Krampus was a force for evil, there seems to have been some confusion about whether that was because of his clear ties to the Christian devil or his less clear ties to the Social Democrats. Either way, they were sure that Krampus wasn't good for kids, and they passed out pamphlets titled Krampus is an Evil Man, warning parents against influencing young children with threats of violent holiday intruder. Though they may have had a point about the traumatic effects of telling misbehaving children they were going to be eaten by St. Nick's evil twin, society wasn't deeply moved. The ban lasted for only about four years, and vague murmurs of disapproval continued only a little while longer. But in the end, no one could keep Krampus down. By the end of the 20th century, Krampus was back in full force, and in recent years he's made the leap across the pond to the United States. He's had cameos on many TV shows, including Grimm, Supernatural, The Colbert Report, to name a few. Some American cities, like Los Angeles, host annual Krampus celebrations that feature costume contests, parades, traditional dances, bell ringing, and alpine horn blowing. Cookies, dirndls, and masks are de rigueur. So if you think Christmas needs a little touch of Halloween, see if your city has a Krampus Nacht celebration, and don't forget to dress up. With that knowledge now tucked safely in our brains, let's read a couple of Krampus stories. <laughs> our first of the two that I'd like to share tonight was well, quite enjoyable for me to read, and I do believe it'll be obvious why once I get started, so... Shall I? It was the night before Christmas and all through the house. Not a creature was stirring. Well, that's not true as I was awake setting up my annual Santa trap. This year, I was determined to catch him and demand I be put on the nice list. So I tried to smuggle a hippo out of the zoo for Christmas to reenact a Christmas carol. So I put ants on my sister's pillow, fluttered our road by accident by breaking the fire hydrant, and broke mom's favorite ornament. I was a good kid! Regardless, I was going to be on the nice list one way or another. Teddy from school is wrong. Krampus won't come get me. He's not even real. I laughed to myself as I recalled the story my friend told me. Giant horns, face as gnarly as coal, goat-like features, and hungry for children. It was ridiculous. I placed a plate of homemade chocolate chip cookies and a glass of milk under the big refrigerator box I had set up. This is going to get you this year, fat man, I snickered. Little did I know, insulting Santa was a bad move. I sat on our plush couch, waiting and waiting for jolly old St. Nick to jump down from the chimney and eat up the cookies. I was beginning to fall asleep when I heard an eerie noise coming from Santa Claus's domain. The noise of long, sharp fingernails coming down and scratching against old Brett. I quickly tensed up and stood. Grabbing the fire poker from the holder, I hid behind the tree racking my brain for an explanation. That wasn't St. Nick. A low, gravelly laugh came from the fireplace as a figure dark as Santa's pole slithered out from the depths. 
It snatched up the cookies, spilled the milk, and mangled the stockings. It broke mother's fine china, father's trophy collection, and, worst of all, smashed the family photos hanging on the wall. Whatever this creature was, it wasn't friendly. I went looking around for something. Seven. Scary. From this to give you a fright, it said in a sing-song tone as it threw the couch aside expecting to find someone. It snickered. You have been naughty, lazy, and bad. So I'll steer you from your mom and dad. It threw aside the recliner as it kept singing. Silent night. Scream and cry. Children quake. At my sight, the TV went flying. I froze in fear as it started making its way to the tree, my hiding place. Now it's payback and you're scared. And your parents won't miss you because I am prepared. They won't remember having you. Because now you're mine and your payment is due. I screamed in terror as he threw the tree. He picked me up with his Grinch-esque fingers and laughed as I looked into his red eyes. Gnarled face, devil's horns, gnashed teeth. It was Krampus. He gave an Ebenezer screwed sneer as he tossed me into his large, dark sack. He slithered back up the chimney and left from rooftop to rooftop, throwing in other naughty children with me. I knew there was no escape. I am now writing this tale from inside his lair. His deep, dark, and torturous lair. I don't remember my family, my friends, or my life before this point. I only remember what I have documented here. I'm putting this into Krampus's sack, so hopefully next Christmas someone will find it. Heed my warning. Do be nice before Christmas night, and hopefully Krampus will not give you a fright. <laughs> now see what I mean by enjoyable. Adventures like this have always been quite fun for me to read, especially because of how easy it reads with the intended intonation. But I do concede that may just be me. <laughs> Regardless, I hope you dearies didn't mind me singing too much. I simply couldn't help myself. <laughs> uh, moving on. Our second story for the night is quite chilling, I must warn you. For you see, this story is from the perspective of a child kidnapped with no real recollection of being so. Without further ado, I present to you a Krampus Christmas. Mikey opened his eyes, and he realized his body was cramped. He tried to move, but found that he was inside some sort of a rough canvas bag that scratched at his face and hands and feet. Sure that it was a bad dream, Mikey pinched his cheeks hard, but just yelped in pain. He wasn't dreaming. The last thing Mikey remembered was falling asleep in his bed. It had been Christmas Eve, and he was anxiously awaiting finally getting his first car. Even though he was a few years away from being able to legally drive, his sister had also gotten her first Porsche at 13, so he was sure that he'd get one this year as well. Thoughts of his new car vanished as he brought himself into the present. He had no idea how he had gotten into this rough sack, but he knew that he had been kidnapped. Mikey thought about his classmate Ronald, who had gotten kidnapped when he was vacationing in South America. He thought it would be cool to be kidnapped, as you were only kidnapped if your parents were super wealthy or famous, but this was not cool at all. Mikey tried to call for help, but there was no response. He struggled a bit, and as he pushed against the burlap sack, he could suddenly feel fresh air on his shoulder. 
Mikey curled up his body and tried to reposition himself so he could press against the small hole with his fist. After managing to get his hand free, Mikey felt around and grasped for a long piece of cord. He tugged at it and after some time, the knot fell away and the bag opened up. The walls of the bag fell around Mikey's body and he suddenly felt scared as he was no longer obscured in his sack. Even though Mikey was dressed in his Gucci tracksuit he wore as pajamas, he felt alone and naked as he realized he was definitely not in a good place. The floor was made of cobblestones, and the only light came from a series of torches mounted on the wall. The stone walls were covered in black filth, and there were chains and shackles hanging from them. Mounds of dirty children's pajamas and slippers littered the area, and across from where Mikey stood, it looked like a butcher shop out of a horror film. Chunks of meat hung from the hooks, and a collection of large knives hung from the wall above the sink. Mikey didn't realize that the handles of the knives were all repurposed bones, but he didn't need to in order to realize he needed to get out of there. He slunk past a giant bubbling cauldron, so large he would have to tiptoe to even have a chance to see into it. But he looked back at all of the kid-sized slippers littering the place and didn't want to know what was being cooked. Mikey tried to step quietly as he moved through the cavernous space, sticking close to the walls. There were not many hiding places, but the shadows cast by the pillars along the walls were deep enough that he might hope to be overlooked by anyone coming his way. As he came upon the doorway, Mikey froze. There was a narrow spiral staircase of stone steps leading upwards. Realizing there would be no place to hide and having no idea how long the staircase went, Mikey weighed his options. If he stayed, a bloody death at the hands of some unknown monster was certain. If he fled, he might get caught again, but at least there was a chance he might be able to escape before he was found. Mikey took a deep breath to calm himself and then began to ascend the stairs. The stone steps quickly became cool as he climbed, the heat of the kitchen fading quickly as he rounded the first bend. Mikey looked up and all he could see were more stairs in darkness. There were no torches on the walls here. Mikey's heart felt like it was going to burst through his chest, but he knew he had to continue on. Step by step, Mikey climbed the stone staircase, and his eyes began to adjust to the darkness the best they could. The stairs were so devoid of light, he could barely make out the next step, so he clung to the wall and moved carefully. He looked down, then up, and there was no telling how long the staircase went on or how far he had come. Mikey sighed, but continued on. Mikey had no idea how long he had been climbing the staircase. He hadn't counted each step, and with no way of knowing if he was close to the top or how far he had come, time had slipped away. His legs began to hurt, and his feet were almost numb, as the steps had grown icy cold quite a long time ago. Mikey had been sweating when he left the dungeon-like kitchen, but that sweat had cooled and dried, and now he found himself shivering. Suddenly, he could see a faint glow coming from above, and a radiant warmth became apparent. Mikey's steps were painful, but he forced himself up quicker now as the allure of heat overrode his caution. The higher he climbed, Mikey could feel the chill fade away, and he wasn't sure if he was hallucinating, but he could swear he smelled hot cocoa. Where was he? Mikey followed the warmth and light and had to squint his eyes at the light becoming stronger. The young boy paused where he was, letting his eyes adjust to the light again after being so long in the dark. The stone steps were warm again, and he dropped down to crawl these last few steps. The staircase felt warm, and Mikey had a half mind to fall asleep there, cradled by its warmth after his long, frigid trek. Mikey slowly pulled his weary body up, step by step, and he peeked from the mouth of the staircase. He saw a great hall filled with Christmas lights strung up along the high beams leading to the most massive Christmas tree Mikey had ever seen. He was covered in glistening blown glass ornaments and shimmering tinsel. The tree towered above all the small, unattended, child-sized workbenches and stools that sat in neat little rows. Along the walls were a plethora of giant fireplaces, all spaced apart so that the heat could be felt even from where Mikey stood. 
Mikey looked around hesitantly at this new environment so different from the cold, brutal underground he had emerged from. The great hall was empty, and so he tentatively stepped out towards the nearest fireplace and took a seat. The heat warmed his frigid body, and he slowly began to stop shaking. The feeling returned to his fingers and toes. The warmth felt so good, Mikey could barely keep his eyes open. Cradled by the heat, he wrapped his arms around his knees and felt his eyes began to close. Hey there, friend. Mikey's eyes shot open and he yelped and spun around. Mikey saw a tall man with a kind face smiling at him. Sorry to scare you. I forgot something in the workshop, so I came back to get it, but then I found you and I just thought you looked so lost and could use some help. The man was thin but muscular, and he was wearing a forest green vest and red pants. He looked young, but somehow seemed much, much older. Are you okay? Uh, where am I? And who are you? Well, you're at the North Pole, at Santa's workshop. My name is Illithras, but you can call me Illy. Illy extended his hand, and Mikey tentatively shook it. Illy's hand was smooth as silk. Hi, Illy. I'm Mikey. Mikey Pinson. Illy smiled. Hello, Mikey Pinson. You seem quite far away from home. I know not of any human families living nearby. A confused look came over Mikey's face. Ah, I am an elf, Mikey. As are almost all of the resident craftspeople here at Santa's workshop. But you look human, and elves and Santa don't exist. Ah, Mikey, you see, I most certainly am an elf, and I'm here in flesh and blood right before you. Billy brushed back his long silver hair to allow a giant pointed ear to be extended from its hiding place. Also, Santa is most definitely also real. I know it seems like he isn't, but it serves our purpose much more easily if people don't believe it so. Mikey wasn't sure what to believe anymore. Was he really at the North Pole? Mikey, I'm sure all of this is a lot to take in, but let me show you something. Illy walked over to the stone wall next to the fireplace and pressed his hands against the stone. The stone gave way as if it was made of liquid, and Illy muttered something as he pulled his hands outward. The wall seemed to stretch as a newly formed window, complete with ornate grills joining the multiple panes of glass, seemed to appear out of nowhere. Mikey gasped as he slowly walked over. He slowly reached out and touched the icy glass. He tried to make out some sort of buildings or signs of life, but all he could see was a world of swirling white snow and far-off mountains of ice. Whoa, how'd you do that? Mikey stared out the window, then at Illy, then back to the window. Mikey pressed at the sill, the polished rock smooth under his hand. It's magic, Mikey. Craftsman and magic, to be precise. It allows a skilled user to create new things out of old, like a window where none was before. Or it allows us to make toys for the good little children around the world. Illy smiled, beaming with pride. Wow, Mikey stepped back. What else can you make? Can you make a drone? Or a laptop? Illy chuckled. Slow down, my little friend. Before we get carried away here, we really should be getting you back home. Your parents are going to miss you. Can your magic do that, Illy? Can you make me a door that'll transport me back home to Illinois? Or can you make a teleporter gun that'll make a portal that'll get me back home? I'm a craftsperson, Mikey, not a wizard. Mikey frowned. My magic isn't nearly strong enough. I'm only 800 years old. In order to even attempt transcontinental tra teleportation, I'd need to be a few centuries older. But there is someone who could easily fold space and time, and that's Santa himself. Mikey smiled. So there is a way to get back home. Definitely. I'm not even sure how you got here, but whatever happened, I'm sure Santa will be able to take you back home to wherever you belong. Illy beamed a huge smile. Why don't we head over to Santa's room and meet him now? The horrors of being woken up in the sack and the piles of children's clothes suddenly came back to Mikey. Wait, I was kidnapped! 
I woke up in some sack downstairs. Mikey stepped backwards, suddenly suspicious of his new friend. Ah, Mikey, I understand. The caverns below this workshop belong to Krampus. Think of him as Santa's counterpart who deals with naughty children. He kidnaps children and brings them here to scare them, then leaves Santa to take them back to their homes. But I saw a bunch of kids' pajamas and slippers and a pile down there. I've read the stories. He's eating them. Ellie laughed. Oh, Mikey, don't be silly. Those are discarded clothes that the children have left behind after they've gotten their new holiday outfits from Santa. And yes, Krampus is also our chef who catches and butchers seals and fish and sometimes the occasional killer whale. As I remember, dinner should be served soon and, and I think seal stew is on the menu. He doesn't ever eat children. His scary visage and mythology is just frighten them into behaving better. Illy smiled his warm smile again and Mikey couldn't see any hint of lying. It did make a lot more sense. After all, if Krampus was really going to eat him, would he have really just left Mikey to escape? Mikey smiled and Illy took Mikey's hand in his own. Let's go meet Santa, shall we? Illy led the way through the joyous halls to a large red door decorated with a beautifully lush wreath. Illy knocked at the door. Santa, may I request an audience? I have found a lost child, one of Krampus's abductees, I presume. The door creaked open. Illy walked in, but Mikey hesitated. Illy looked back at the cowering boy. Don't worry, Mikey. Santa will make things right. He'll take you home. Come on. Mikey slowly released his grip on the door and walked into the room. The room was sparse, surprisingly so, given the level of decoration in the Grand Hall. There were giant fur rugs on the ground and a single fireplace that housed some glowing embers. Large candelabras floated in the air, suspended by some magical force, and in the far corner was a giant chair that looked almost like a throne. Mikey's eyes grew wide as he saw a giant, jolly-faced man dressed in a red robe with white, furry trim seated there. Illy gently ushered Mikey forward. The boy looked up at the massive man in front of him. Santa? Ho ho ho! Why hello, Mikey Penston. Welcome to the North Pole! Santa let out a belly laugh and smiled, his white teeth shining in the candlelight. I see our old boy Krampus has been up to no good. Santa stood and walked over to the pair. Illy was tall, at least six feet tall by Mikey's guess, but Santa towered even over Illy. Santa was a giant, and Mikey understood why the door was so large. I found him in the workshop, sir, and thought you'd be able to bring him back to his home in Illinois, back in the United States. Ah, uh, thank you, Illy. You did a great job. Also, good work on those stone fountains you created yesterday. Top-notch masonry and the electronics were well done as well. Thank you, sir. Your praises are too kind. Illy beamed and bowed his head. Oh, Illy. While I prepare little Mikey here for his trip back home, would you be a dear and gather up the rest of the elves? I believe it will be dinner time soon. My pleasure, Santa. Illy bowed deeply and turned to leave. Nice to meet you, Mikey. Have a safe trip back home. Thank you, Illy. Thank you for everything. Mikey waved as Illy smiled, waved back, then turned and left. Santa smiled, then waved his hand, and the giant door slowly closed. Well then, Mikey, let's get you back to where you belong, shall we? Santa smiled and waved his hand again, and a glowing blue portal appeared. Just head through that portal and you'll be back where you belong. Oh, uh, Illy said something about new clothes as well. Santa looked at Mikey for a second, then smiled again. Ah, yes, the new outfit. How could I have forgotten? Santa snapped his fingers, and a giant wrapped gift box appeared in front of Mikey. Why don't you try them on when you're on the other side? And with that, Santa pushed Mikey through the portal. Mikey landed on a pile of warm laundry, but as he looked up at the ceiling, instead of his familiar blue ceiling, he saw moss-covered stone. 
He looked to his side and realized he wasn't lying on a pile of laundry, but a pile of discarded pajamas. Mikey sat up, and sure enough, he was back in Krampus' kitchen. He realized that he was naked, and his tracksuit crumpled next to him. The ceiling began to warp and twist, and Santa dropped down through the void. He walked next to the cauldron, picked up a giant ladle, and began stirring the cock. Santa? Santa stopped stirring the cauldron and walked over to where Mikey was cowering. Mikey noticed Santa had stopped smiling. That's my name when I'm up there. Santa's voice dropped a few registers as he spoke, his jovial tone turning into a bestial growl. But now we're down here, right where you belong. Santa's jolly face began to drip off and Mikey screamed. Mikey watched as Santa's hair turned dark black and his eyes coal red. Horns began to sprout, pushing back his red hood as his lips seemed to fall off. Santa's teeth grew extended and sharp as his sickly tongue fell from his mouth, lolling around like a worm. Krampus stretched out his hand as one of the knives flew from his place from the sink into his hand. Mikey screamed again and didn't stop for a painfully long time. Santa... Santa looked up from his table to see Illy staring up at him. Yes, what is it, Illy? I was wondering if you dislike Krampus's method of scaring children so much. Why do you let him continue to do that? Any one of us elves could easily take over cooking duties given proper training. Santa smiled his jolly grin. Illy, as distasteful as it is, Krampus' methods do wonders to make sure children are behaving. After all, he only kidnaps children who are so twisted and evil they are beyond redemption. Beyond redemption? But, Santa, don't you take all those children back to their parents after their fear of Krampus has inspired a new way of living? Of course, good Ellie, of course. What I meant to say was that if Krampus never got involved, these children would never be able to stay on the true, righteous path we try to inspire with our gifts. For the hundreds of children who might be encouraged to be kind and generous through positive encouragement, there are always a few who must be encouraged to curb their wicked ways through fear. It is not the way I wish the world to be, but how it is. Just think as Krampus as, well, someone who shares the same beliefs that I do, but just acts upon them in a different way. I see. Uh, what about Mike? Is he really that good? To be honest, Mikey was not a good child. He bullied others and tormented many of his classmates. He had zero empathy for anyone but himself, and he was manipulative, a cruel little boy. But he seemed so nice. Billy's face contorted as he tried to reconcile the new information. Billy. You haven't been out there to see the human world, but when they get in trouble, bullies are just like any other child. They cry, plead for help, rely on the kindness of strangers. But once they get an ounce of power, they start taking and taking, and their greed and need for power consumes them. Santa walked over to Illy and put his hand on the elf's shoulder. I know your mind is troubled, Illy. Go have another bowl of the stew, and Think not of Krampus and his unsavory methods or the evils of the world. Go eat up, son, and let the meat give you the strength to continue on the righteous path. Just focus on all of the good children you're helping through your work. Thank you, sir. I appreciate your time and guidance. With that, Billy turned and walked back and filled his bowl with another serving of stew. That twist ending actually got me. What about (laughs) y'all? You can see why I just had to include it in tonight's special, (laughs) yes? I loved the pacing and the overall tone set within this one. And if I may be honest, I think I might actually make a personal tradition of reading this one every year as anyone else does with The Night Before Christmas. Don't worry, little phantoms. Every story on Fantastic is going to be new, I promise. No repeats allowed here. (laughs) 
Now that I've got some Christmas cheer going, though, I do believe it's time that we've wrapped up this part of our special. Did you enjoy learning of Krampus, or did you prefer listening to his stories? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. If you have any scary story suggestions, you can add them to me on any of my social medias, which you'll find in the description, or email them to luckymisfortune at gmail.com. That's L-U-C-K-Y-M-S-F-O-R-T-U-N-E at gmail, and I'd love to read it for a future episode. And of course, if any of my listeners tonight are able to and want to support the show financially, there are links to my Patreon, Coffee, and OnlyFans in the description as well. As a reminder, once we reach 500 Little Phantoms, I will be sharing one of my own personal scary ghost stories. So make sure that you're subscribed, following whatever the platform you're tuning in on lets you do. <laughs> now, thank you so much for tuning in this warm holiday evening. May your holidays be filled with love and joy, and to those celebrating Christmas specifically like I am, Merry Christmas to all, and to all a good night. Yeah.